dear learners greetings from iit guwahati we are in the mooc course power plant system engineering module 4 that is hydro and renewable energy power generation systems so in the first uh, component of this module we will focus on hydro power systems part 1 so in this hydro power systems or in this lecture we will try to give some glimpses of hydroelectric power plants its components what are the different elements um, that are uh, the part of this hydroelectric power plants and most important features uh, is that uh, hydraulic turbines which is the main backbone for this hydro power systems in which power is developed from water and uh, one such turbines is a pelton wheel and we'll discuss about the fluid mechanics and theoretical aspects of this pelton wheel concepts and how it becomes useful for harnessing water power so let us try to see the feasibility of water power what does this mean now if you look at the power which is available from the water and we normally call this as hydraulic power one can write a fundamental equations like power available from water density multiplied by if something like potential head or potential energy available in water that means we are keeping some slug of or some quantity of water at a certain height and looking at the density of water is 1000 kg per meter cube if you increase q or h then we can have enormous number of, of power which can be available from water so what it means for us is that if you try to uh, make this water for electrical energy conversions then one can write a fundamental equations that is w is equal to uh, g g means 9.81 q h and f is we include a some some term efficiency and t is the operating time in hours so what it means that by increasing q and h and if the turbine can operate throughout the year that is 8760 or per year then we can see that this quantity is very huge so in other words we can say there is certain feasibility of water power if it can be harnessed properly then let us look into the possibilities how we can harness one way to look at that when we have rain and it is falling on hard surface then we have its potential energy availability when it rains and rain water proceeds towards ocean through in its path through its rivers so if we can see that river is available at certain height and if you can take that slug of mass of water or the quantity of water is taken as the volume flow rate of water then we can use that height of the reservoir or river river to harness the water power and that is the reason since we don't require any kind of fuels we call this a as a natural available energy source so the theme of this hydro power plant is the energy of water is is being utilized to drive the turbine and in turn it produces the electricity and uh, next to the thermal power the water power is the next level power production unit and we call this as a hydroelectric power plant and till date 20% of the total power of the world is made by hydro power stations now looking at these things uh, if you look see that what is the different advantage of hydroelectric power plants so basically they are uh, water is perennially available and in most of the rivers as well uh, since there is no fuel is required then we call, you can call it as a white coal it's a renewable form or or, or we call this as a white coal the 
running cost of hydro power station is very low as compared to its competitors like thermal and nuclear power stations. There is no concept of pollution. Modern hydro generators have high efficiency over considerable range of load variations. So that means, hydro electric turbines can be switched on or off in a very short time. Hydro power is emission free and they does not produce any greenhouse gases. The concept of hydro power plant is very simple and but uh, and its system reliability is much better greater than any other power plants. Hydro power plants have a very greater life expectancy that means, if you install a hydro power station uh, today and assuming that water will be available or the river will be existence for another 50 years, then we can think of its lifetime as long as the water is available, we can think of its uh, life expectancy is about 50 years or more. As compared to any other competitors like thermal or nuclear power plants. Hydro power plants are ideally spinning reserves and it can be integrated with other power plants. It provides the geographical ecosystems that means, with benefits of irrigation because you need to store water through a dam depending on the requirement of irrigations the water can be controlled. So, it helps in afforestation, navigations, aquaculture and being simple in design and operations hydro power plants do not also require any skilled manpower. So, there are many advantages, but there are some loopholes or demerits because uh, the hydro power generations incur very high capital cost with low rate of return. That means, if you want to uh, the entire infrastructure which is being invested, it is requires almost 15 to 20 years to get back the return. And this high power station is highly dependent on the quantity of the water which is available. And moreover, hydro power plants are site specifics and because of these reasons they incur transmission losses since because somewhere there will be grid available, but we have to, um, but the hydro power plant has to be located in restricted sites. Many a times the hydro power plants may disturb the ecology of the systems. So, emphasis is more uh, given for small mini or micro hydro power stations instead of talk, thinking of large power stations people nowadays think of mini or micro hydel power stations. So, this is some of the schematic diagram which says that if you look at mini or micro hydel power stations, we can imagine to have water availability in a pond, construct a dam, allow the water through some pipes and it goes to the turbine and um, turbine and powerhouse where we can harness this um, water power. So, available head for this we call this as a water head. So, such a simple concept can also be utilized through micro or mini hydel power stations. Now, let us look into the complete features or elements of this hydro electric power plants. This figure shows the schematic diagrams of a or layout of hydro electric power plants. What we see is that there are the catchment area. So, it is the big area which is available and for which maybe you can say it is a river area in across which the river spreads with a very steeper slope because we need to have a slope or um, free fall of water. So, we require some slope and uh, also we need to and uh, in which a dam can be constructed. So, in a catchment area of river we can think of a reservoir uh, and this reservoir will be located across a dam and controlled water can come through this sluice gate or valve through pipelines and that we call as a penstock. That means, in hydro power uh, terminology we call this the penstock, it is simply the water pipes. Then through this penstock it goes to the turbine end. So, here this turbine end we harness the power and uh, then it can be integrated with alternator for which electric power generation can be possible. Then uh, the discharge water has to be going through the tail race, tail race means is another kind of a 
catchment area where water is being discharged. One most important thing is that uh, is that uh, the water has to pass through a draft tube and this draft tube has a very significant component of this power plant unit because it creates a necessary control pressure difference of upstream and downstream. Um, and uh, water has to go in a smooth manner to the tail race. So, with this objective so that necessary it does not incur many hydraulic losses. So, these are the essential components. So, I explained about the catchment area and dam, then, uh, then we have the reservoir, these are like uh, natural water bodies, river or lake, dam has to be constructed. So, this has to perform the, because this dam is required, because we need to have continuous operation of the turbine. So, we need to have a storing capacity, that means we must have an estimates what how much water should be available or flow for volume flow rate of water is available while maintaining appropriate head. So, one can think of a dam to have a moderate head with large storage capacity or high head with small storage. So, these two things possibility way we can think of while constructing a dam. Then the next important component is spillway. Now, when water flow flows through this penstock or dam and uh, uh, in some uh, cases when you say that stability of the dam is in danger, then we should have provisions for this reservoir basin to dispose of some of the water. That means, excess water should be relieved and this is, this is relieved through a structure which is called as a spillway. So, it or uh, in general it pro provides structural stability to the dam without raising the uh, reser reservoir water to high flood level. Then the passage of water in a channel known as head race and it leads to the water in a conduct. Now, this conduct that means when you when the water comes from the dam to the turbine the possible ways that we can think of uh, with we can think of a, a closed passage typically a penstock or pipe and we call this as a conduct. Now, through this conduct what does it mean is that we that is a regulated pressure difference which is maintained between because since it is a closed conduct we say regulated pressure difference between the reservoir end and turbine end that is maintained. Other po possibilities option is that we can open up this penstock that means we can think of the penstock as a channel open channel flow from the reservoir end to turbine so it's a it's through by by assigning suitable slope for the passage of water so in a manner that way we call this channel have a two components one is head race other is the tail race so in that case what happens that entire uh, flow through this open channel flow is almost atmospheric. So, that is another kind of possibilities we can have while thinking of for the passage of water from reservoir to turbine end. Then we have other components like a surge tank. So, surge tank is nothing but a small reservoir in which water level rises or falls to reduce the pressure wings that are uh, when they are not transmitted in the closed conduct. That means, when we have a penstock or co closed conduct that means, the, the, the we have a control pressure difference. Now, let us assume that the water is passing through a open channel or it is a lake or in a in, in lake in that case sometimes when there is a reservoir basin has a very high water then of course, the quantity of water in the lake uh, will be also high. So, uh, a surge tank is required so that it does not allow excess water. And most uh, important component here the drop tube. So, it is a drop tube is a divergence configurations in which is uh, made uh, when the water is discharged from the turbine. So, this diffuser action for the drop tube uh, regains major portion of the kinetic energy or velocity of the runner at the outlet which otherwise would go as a waste or exit. Then last component what we call as a powerhouse. So, it is nothing but uh, the a stable structure which has uh, all types of plant equipment like 
hydraulic turbines, electric generators, governors, valves, storage batteries, switchboards, etc. Now, let us see that how hydropower plants can be classified. So, the classifications are normally done based on the availability of head. One can think of high head, medium head and low head. And this also can think of the uh, link to the quantity of water availability, high discharge, low discharge or medium discharge. So, accordingly we can say that we can think of mini or micro hydro power plants a runway, river without pondage, with pondage, storage reservoir and all. The other uh, way of classification is the nature of load that is base load or peak load. That means, for what circumstances whether the hydro power plant is designed for a simple base load operations or it is required to cater the peak load. That means, at the time of demand it can give the excess power. So, that way we call this as a uh, nature of load, electric load which is uh, which, which is linked in this alternator or this alternator is again further integrated to the turbines. Then we have uh, like for example, to give some estimates, if you think a mini power plants it operates with a height of uh, 5 meter to 20 meter and it produces a power in the range 1 to 5 megawatt. While micro power plants they work uh, uh, under a head below 5 meters, but they produce the electricity range from 0.1 to 1 megawatt. Uh, but uh, in any case uh, we can go the for maximum energy resources from the water we can go up to 20,000 megawatt. That means, it is a very highest structure or it is a large scale hydroelectric power plant. Now, let us move on to next segment which is hydraulic turbines. In fact, it is the backbone of a hydroelectric power plants because they convert potential energy of the water into the shaft work which is in turn coupled with the electric generators for producing the power. So, historically hydraulic turbines are derived from water wheels. So, initially there was no concept of water turbine, hydraulic turbines rather people used to call as a water wheels. One such name comes up like a Pelton wheel, but with more developments uh, has happened in recent days and based on that the hydraulic turbines are classified with difference in the elevation of water surface available between upstream and downstream of the turbine. And here if you look at this particular turbines, if we have the reservoir for which and we have the tail race, tail race means where water is discharged that means the storage at this point and dispose of water at this point. So, we call this as a gross head. Now, coming back water comes through certain pipelines. So, that is the reason it is a we call this as a hydraulic grade, grade lines in which it incurs a loss of HF. So, ultimately the net head which is available to the water is H which is nothing but the gross head minus HF hydraulic loss. So, under this head and that head is varies in the range from 2 to 2000 meter. So, when it is low head we say 2 to 15 meter, when you say medium head it is 16 to 70 meter when you say high head it is 71 to 500 meters and very high head even above 500 meter. So, more or less we can say 2000 meter is the topmost level in which the potential energy of water can be available. Now, depending on the availability of the flow the turbines are classified as low uh, turbines and we call and one such case is a Pelton wheel medium availability of the flow and high discharge flow. So, we have Pelton wheel, Francis turbines and Kaplan turbines. And uh, apart from this the hydraulic turbines are classified based on the head and quantity of the uh, water uh, available to us. A second category is the working principle of the blade that, that is what we have said I have mentioned earlier that when we say that passage of the water through a pen stock or controlled manner. 
So, entire slug of water goes and heats the turbine and that are used for harnessing water power. This is one way. Other way to look at is that uh, whatever potential energy available in this water uh, in this reservoir, first it is converted to kinetic energy by some passing it through a nozzle and this kinetic energy is used to uh, strike on blades or buckets or on a wheel that rotates. So, that is another concept of working principle. Another way is that direction of flow of water that means initially it can be radial and final entry for the out of outlet from the turbine could be axial or it may be vice versa or it can be a mixed flow. So, depending on the direction of the water flow it can also be specified. Depending on the axis of the shaft and also depending on the specific speed. Specific speed it decides whether it is a very slow runner that means or it is a very fast runner. So, whatever I have explained this has been noted down here based on the mode of conversion of potential energy of water into shaft work the turbines are classified as impulse and reaction turbines and in impulse mode the available head of water is converted to kinetic energy in a nozzle and then the water shoots out from the nozzle as a free jet uh, at atmospheric pressure before and after the striking the vein of the turbine. Now, another way of looking at that when the entire flow of head which is available and the reservoir they are used to pass through a closed conduct then it is a it is works in a reaction mode and in this reaction mode a control pressure difference is maintained and here the water is simply guided to strike on the blade. So, there is no conversion of uh, the potential energy to kinetic energy in between. So, that is called as a reaction mode. We will try to explain subsequently uh, for this impulse and reaction concepts. Then the depending on the orthogonal directions of the turbines uh, then it can be considered as a radial flow which is a Francis turbine, axial flow like pro, um, propeller and Kaplan turbine and tangential flow uh, for Pelton turbine with respect to wheel and the shaft axis refers to the axial directions. Now, when the flow at the inlet is radial and axial is uh, outlet then uh, we call this as a mixed flow. If the flow is neither parallel to axis nor perpendicular then it is moves as an angular direction with respect to axis. So, we call this as a diagonal flow such an example is derived for turbines. Now, turbine shaft can be either vertical or horizontal. So, Pelton turbines have horizontal shaft while other turbines have vertical shafts. The last feature of classification is through specific speeds. More details about the definition of the specific speeds we will discuss in the subsequent class, but what the bottom line or importance of this specific speed with respect to physical significance of the turbine is that the low specific heats denotes slow runner and high specific speeds denotes fast runners. So, this is the overall complete classifications which is shown in these tables for the water turbines. We can say there are four category of turbines Pelton, Francis, Ploperol, Krappen, Derais turbines. They depending on the flow directions they can have a tangential flow, radial, axial, diagonal flow. Based on the specific speeds we can say slow, medium and high. So, in the slow range we have Pelton wheel we have Francis turbine, we have Kaplan turbines, then the classifications based on the size of the turbines, we can have maximum head, maximum power, maximum diameters and specific speed also can be here. So, we can in these things we can say Pelton turbines are uh, low specific speed where Kaplan turbines have very high specific speed. And if you link these two to head, normally Pelton wheels have um, very high, uh, they can operate at very high head and when you have availability of head is less then we can refer for a uh, go for a Kaplan turbine. So, that way the judgment is done based on the depending on a locality whether what type of turbine is best suited at that particular site. Now, let us move on to the 
first class of turbine which is called as Pelton wheels. So, uh, the summary is that these are impulse turbines, they are used for high head installations. The main working principle is that whatever water available water is there, they are first converted to the kinetic energy in a nozzles and these nozzles are discharges free jet of water that heats on the bucket which revolves around a shaft. So, this figure says that we have a shaft and across the shaft there is a runner. This runner uses the bucket, uh, bo these are buckets. Now, what we see is that where, where, from wherever the water available and it comes as a nozzle, comes in a nozzle and this nozzle gives the free jets. So, there is a deflector. So, depending on this keeps on, the deflector position keeps on changing because the buckets are passed one by one. So, when the, the when the first jet of water hits this bucket, so it pushes this runner to rotate and so that next bucket again gets interacted with this water jets. So, through this process we can have a continuous um, rotation of this wheel and that is the reason we call as a it is a Pelton wheel. Pelton is the name of the scientist who proposed this concept of this water wheel and since then it is called as a Pelton wheel. Now, let us try to understand the that means in order to make the estimates of how, how much water or energy is being transmitted to the shaft, we need to uh, explore this velocity diagrams. So, what when you see this water jet, it, it we can say that velocity of the water is V1 and it is goes as a jet and this velocity of the water is being utilized to give since the runner rotates at a rotational speed and uh, this rotational speed based on the diameter can be considered as a uh, linear speed of this bucket that Vb we can estimate based on the rotations. So, the total velocity initially when you say it is as a V1 of the jet and it has composed of two parts one is Vb and Vr1 and when the water goes out it goes it comes and hits a jet and it goes out through this uh, bucket in this fashion and we through and we have a splitter. So, when the water is gets discharged from this bucket it is ensured that the discharge water does not uh, interact with the uh, inlet water jets otherwise it will create an interference. So, based on that the velocity triangles can be constructed uh, one at inlet this is at this we can say as a inlet and this we can say outlet. So, uh, through this process we can say that bucket is induced with a velocity V b and also we can uh, include this angle beta 2 and in the next diagrams uh, I will show you that how this velocity diagrams is useful for harnessing the power. Now, moving some more deep concept into this water jets, this is another kind of Pelton wheel arrangement which involves multi jets. So, the in this previous figure we are showing that there is only one jet which is hitting water, but uh, the concept can be extended we can have a multiple jets that means if you see this is the inlet in which water is coming and and when this when this is water is coming it keeps on uh, interacting there are multiple nozzles and these nozzles are kept through this pure rods and these nozzles uh, allow to allow the water jets to heat these buckets at multiple locations and this is what we call as a multiple Pelton wheels arrangements. So, in general we can go up to maximum 6 jets and through this we can achieve maximum specific speed of 30 and there is a expressions in which we can find out depending on the number of jets we can increase the specific speed for a given for this particular Pelton wheel turbine. That means, initially when you have a single jet we have specific speed relatively less when we have more number of jets then we can increase the specific speed for the same turbines. So, that is called as a multi jet Pelton wheel arrangement. Now, this particular diagram uh, gives you the concept 
how we can harness the water power or what is the energy transferred from the water to the turbines. So, for that we have to refer these velocity diagrams. So, let us try to understand these velocity triangles at both inlet and outlet. What we see is your nozzle and this nozzle gives you velocity V1 which is the absolute velocity of the water jets. So, it has two components that is uh, bucket component and relative velocity components. So, that means total uh, initially all are in the same line and when the water goes out, it goes out in a, uh, it is deflected by a certain manner and this deflection is normally kept as 165 degree and it is the most ideal way. The main reason for keeping this deflection is that, that when the water goes out or water exists from this uh, bucket, it is, it should not interact the main stream. So, that is the reason, uh, that means V R 2 and V uh, and V 1 should not interact each other. So, for that reasons, these angles are designed and uh, optimum angle has been fixed at 165 degree, so that deflection it ensures maximum power subjected to no interaction of inlet and outlet water jets. Then we can introduce a parameter which is called as a jet ratio, it is a sizing parameter which is the ratio of diameter of the bucket with the nozzle diameters and its value is in the range of 10 to 24. Now, next thing is that I mentioned about how to quantify. So, velocity of the bucket can be estimated V b that is omega times r that is pi d n by 60s where r stands uh, as a d by 2 which is called as bucket radius where ang an angular velocity omega can be linked to the rpm of the wheel that is twice pi n by 60. We have the jet ratio d by d and most important thing here you can say that velocity of the water jet is estimated by using this expression V1 is equal to uh, Cv times square root of 2 gh. So, here Cv is normally the coefficient of the velocity because as you see that uh, the we have the relative velocity do exist between inland and outlet that is a loss coefficient. So, that is called as uh, that loss coefficient is accounted in this range. So, this is the standard expressions in which V1 is calculated. Then next important segment is that how to find the energy transfer and work output. The, the velocity of the jet issuing from the nozzle can be calculated based on the net head available at the nozzle and the energy transfer to the wheel we can find out using Euler equations. So, the Euler equations can be remembered as E is equal to V w 1 V b 1 minus V w 2 V b 2 by G. Now, let us see what is V w 1 and uh, what is C V w 1 V w 2 and V b 1 and V b 2. So, if you look at this particular figure V uh, b 1 and V b 1 stands for inlet 2 stands for outlet. So, at the inlet and, and, and if you look at bucket velocity we can think of V 1, V B 1 and V B 2 are equal as V B. So, that drives that is the linear motion of velocity of the bucket and coming back to the V W 1 and V W 2 it has two components. If you see the V W 2 what does this mean? Uh, if you see absolute component of the velocity in this horizontal direction we call as a wheel component and in this horizontal component we say it is a V W 2 and here V w 1 is nothing but V 1 itself because it is purely origin component is same as this V 1. Since the uh, water exists there is a angle 165 degree the water goes out at certain uh, angle with relative velocity V r 2 due to this relative velocity with same bucket velocity we will have absolute velocity V 2 and its horizontal component is V w 2. So, this through these diagrams the Euler equation is been derived and finally, we come up for this Pendleton wheel we write V b times V w 1 minus V w 2. Now, let us see what from these velocity diagrams V w 2 can be found out by considering V r 2 and V b 
and this V bar 2 it can be expressed in terms of uh, blade friction coefficients which is similar number uh, which is uh, similar number because there is a whenever there is a relative velocity we call this as a blade friction coefficients that means there is a difference in the velocity co um, at the inlet and outlet whether it is in, in terms of absolute velocity or relative velocity. So, that way V R 2 can be linked with respect to uh, V 1 and V B through a factor k. So, putting these two expressions we arrive at the energy transport to the wheel as 1 minus k cos theta by g into V 1 V B minus V B square. And moreover emphasis is given that bucket deflection angle is always kept as 165 degree. Now, through this expression of energy transfer to the wheel, one can find out what is the optimum velocity for the bucket, because that is the need of the essential design feature has to um, be tuned that how much uh, what should be the optimum velocity at which buckets to uh, move and that also refers to the maximum energy. For harnessing maximum energy, these expressions can be differentiated with respect to Vb and so that we can find the E max that is maximum energy that can be harnessed is 1 minus k cos theta by g into V 1 square by 4. So, this one will give that optimum bucket velocity for maximum veloc uh, maximum work output is equal to V 1 by 2, which means that bucket moves half of the um, jet velocity. Now, another expressions are uh, we can find out or if you look at the uh, whether what is the efficiency level in which this wheel operates. One term or one efficiency that is defined as hydraulic efficiency. Normally, we call uh, the other synonymous terms are bladding efficiency or diagram efficiency because if we because these efficiency are calculated based on the velocity diagrams. So, we call this as a hydraulic uh, efficiency, it is defined as the ratio of energy transport to the wheel to the kinetic energy of input jet. Now, here based on that expressions, we can first find out what is the energy transport to the wheel, then by defining hydraulic efficiency we can introduce the kinetic energy which is in the denominator. So, you take this ratio and define a parameter which is called as velocity ratio that is Vv by V1. Uh, so, uh, hydraulic efficiency defined and subsequently for maximum hydraulic efficiency one can also obtain that optimum velocity ratio is also 1 by 2 which means that for either you take maximum efficiency or you take maximum work out output the ratio of uh, velocity of the bucket to the jet velocity is always half. So, this gives an indication that bucket velocity maximum bucket velocity is always half of the velocity in which jet strikes on the bucket. So, this is a very fundamental expression for a Pelton wheel what is the once you know the jet velocity we can easily find out what is the bucket velocity and with this design conditions the Pelton wheel is always uh, uh, allowed to operate. And for this optimum velocity we can also find out hydraulic efficiency for maximum work and this also is same as what we have estimated earlier that is G max is equal to 1 minus k cos theta by g into V 1 square by 4. Now, here by close look can say that when you say theta is 180 degree we can have maximum hydraulic efficiency is 1, but in this case if you do this then we will have other problem that uh, that means theta becomes 180 degree which means that the exit velocity also will oppose the inlet velocity which will have a detrimental effect on the power productions. So, this particular option is always ruled out. So, ideal number that is chosen is theta is 165 degree, when there is a theta is 165 degree corresponding blade coefficient also in, is introduced for this theta. So, it falls in the range from 0 0.8 to 85 
and this will give a hydraulic efficiency close to 0.88 to 0.91. So, that is the entire idea that, uh, that a Pelton wheel is allowed to operate. Then the last segment that once you have velocity, we have once you have energy, then we can also find out the discharge the with known condition of jet velocity and bucket velocity of the wheel maximum energy output volume flow rate can be calculated. Uh, but there are uh, of course, the Pelton wheels uh, for large size Pelton wheels also always operates with a multi jet concept uh, which can in which which can be used for uh, very high head to produce the power of, um, maybe maximum range up to 240 megawatt. But uh, there are some side effect of this Pelton wheel because erosion arises because, because this wheel operates uh, throughout the year. So, there is a erosion of the blade that arises and it also leads to uh, and also there are issues with cavitation of the nozzles. For that reasons to protect the buckets typical material of choice is uh, chromal uh, alloy steel or stainless steel. So, these are uh, some of the uh, design features or characteristics that how many buckets you require uh, for a given wheel and how many number of jets we can have. So, these are the some uh, realistic numbers that are normally used in the hydro power plants. So, this concludes, but before we leave from this lectures, let us try to understand a numerical problem based on this Pelton wheel. So, what the problem statement says that a Pelton wheel has two jets. So, instead of multi jet we say it is a two jet that means n is two and it works in a net head of 200 meter. It transmits 5 megawatt power while running a shaft at 500 rpm. Uh, the transmission efficiency through the pipeline and nozzle is 90 percent. The jets are uh, tangential uh, uh, to uh, 1.5 meter diameter circle with relative decrement of 10 percent as it passes through the bucket. Blade deflection angle is 165 degree. We need to find out the efficiency of the runner and diameter of the jets. To solve the problems, we have to refer this particular velocity diagram in which we can say that initially water jets from the nozzle heats and it splits into two parts and water goes out with a or water is being deflected by an angle 165 degree. So, to solve the problem first thing is that we have to recall that what is this V 1 which is absolute velocity of the water jet. Uh, that is we can quantify this k times square root of twice g h. Now, here h is we have it is given as 200 meter. Now, k k is we say that there is a relative velocity decrement of uh, 10 percent. So, k can be assumed as 0 0.9. So, there is a decrement of 10 percent. So, k can be assumed at 0 0.9. So, putting this number we can say V 1 is 0 0.9 times square root of 2 into 9.81 into a charge 200. So, putting this number we can find out V 1 as 56.4 meter per second. So, once we know V 1, uh, we can also estimate bucket velocity V b as pi d n by 60. So, here n stands as 500 f rpm d, d is the diameter of the wheel. So, here we say that jets are tangential to 1.5 meter diameter circle. So, d can be taken as 1.5 meter. So, putting this number we can find out bucket velocity as 
meter per seconds. Now, we need to find out what is the efficiency of the runner. So, hydraulic efficiency can be defined as E times kinetic energy of the jet V 1 square by 2 G that is kinetic energy of the jet. So, new denominator part we can estimate now, what is this E that is energy transfer to the wheel we recall this expression as 1 minus k cos theta divided by g into v1 vb minus v b square so putting this expression here this hydraulic efficiency can be expressed as twice times 1 minus k cos theta v1 minus pb into vb divided by v1 square. So, by introducing all numbers we can say eta h is equal to twice times 1 minus k is uh, k cos theta k stands for uh, 0 0.9 cos theta into v1 v1 is 56.4 minus vb is 39.3 into vb that is 39.3 divided by 56.4 whole square so, so, this will give you hydraulic efficiency as 83 percent. So, the first part of the answer we got hydraulic efficiency of the runner is 83 percent. Now, let us see that uh, how we need to find out the diameter of the jet because we know there are two jets. So, one can say how much power you can develop because the, the, the turbine transmits 5 megawatt power, power transmitted is 5000 kilowatt. So, power developed would be 5000 P is equal to this 5000 divided by this hydraulic efficiency and that is equal to 6024 kilowatt and this since there are two jets for uh, um, power developed per jet would be P by 2 that is 30 1 to kilowatt. The power developed per jet we can write it as half m v 1 square which is 3 0 1 2 into 10 to the power 3. Now, what is m is rho into a into v 1. So, here a stands as pi by 4 into d square d stands as the diameter of the jet. So, we can rewrite this equation as half rho a v 1 into v 1 square that is equal to 3 0 1 2 into 10 to the power 3. So, you know what is v 1 we have a as pi by 4 d square. So, putting this number and density of water, so rho as 1000 kg per meter cube. So, putting this number one can find out diameter of this jet as 0 0.2 meter. So, the nozzle produces a water jet of diameter that is equal to 0 0.2 meter. So, for this diameter this hydraulic efficiency is 83 percent uh, and it transmits the power 
5 megawatt while running at 500 rpm. So, with this I conclude thank you for your kind attention. Thank you.